Hey listeners, if you like this podcast, check out our other shows, The Study Table and Training Table. Listen to archived content and in-depth interviews with insiders working with student athletes. It's on our website, www.fredopi.com. Welcome to The Dinner Table, a discussion with food as a lens into cultures and societies. I'm your host, Fred Opie. What you're about to hear are excerpts from a paper presentation that's given at the 1997 Latin American Study Association Conference in Guadalajara, Mexico. Uh, you'll hear papers delivered by me or, and by my uh, former colleague, um, George Priestley. George was a Afro-Panamanian and we had worked at overlapped uh, at the time i was focusing a lot of my own research on uh, blacks in latin america and i focused on the area of central america which later became my book uh, black labor migration in caribbean Guat guatemala 1882 to 1923. george was a prolific scholar he was a great mentor and his work focused on uh, the the afro panamanian experience uh, he grew up in panama the descendant of uh, migrants from Jamaica and eventually relocated like a lot of Afro-Panamanians to Brooklyn. And so a lot of his research um, parallels with my own interest. And that was the question that I asked, why would African-Americans leave the country to go to other places? And in his case, he's asking the question, why did Afro-Panamanians leave Panama and come to Brooklyn? And also, what was the political experience of Afro-Panamanians uh, as they first came there? Again, many of the migrants that both of us look at came to Central America, in my case, African-Americans from the U.S. South that left the port of New Orleans, Mobile, Alabama, and Galveston, Texas, as well as large uh, populations of uh, Afro-Antillians uh, who came from many parts of the Caribbean uh, to Central America. Some of these folks went to Panama first and then from Panama spread out to other parts of Latin America working as railroad workers or for the United Fruit Company of Boston as uh, stevedores or on the banana plantations themselves. Georgia's population is similar. Large numbers of uh, African Americans who left uh, Jamaica and that's where most of the people he's talking about but from Barbados and other parts of the Caribbean went to the Panama Canal uh, for the construction of the canal and after the canal was built uh, settled in Panama. Some of these same people, though, also uh, go to other areas uh, when construction booms are going on, uh, but they are a floating population. But it's a, just a very interesting conversation about black migration uh, around uh, the Caribbean basin. Uh, and I, again, I want to emphasize that George Priestley was a monumental uh, mentor in my own life. And I turned to him so many times for help and support in understanding uh, the tenure process, publication process, uh, and getting me where I am today. He died uh, roughly three to four years ago, um, uh, complications related to hypertension, and I'll never forget uh, one of the last things we did is we were roommates at a conference in um, San Andreas, Colombia. The origins of this transnational community is tied to the expansion of the United States into the Caribbean and Latin America, particularly Panama. This population estimated that 14% of Panama's population first came to the Isthmus from Jamaica in significant numbers in the 1850s to work on the U.S.-built Panama Railroad. And in the 1880s, thousands more came from several Caribbean islands to work on the French Canal project, while the majority, predominantly from Barbados, came in the early 1900s to work on the U.S.-built Panama Canal. On the other hand, it is estimated that over 90% of Panamanians who have migrated to New York uh, from Panama during the 1960-1990 period are of Caribbean or Antillean descent. During most of the 20th century, this population and its offspring in Panama worked mostly for the U.S.-owned Panama Canal Company in the Canal Zone, for U.S. military bases in the zone, for U.S. firms in cities of Panama and Colón, and for U.S. companies in the province of Bocas del Toro, including the Chiriqui Land Company, a major banana firm, 
unlike English-speaking Caribbean or West Indian populations, however, in Costa Rica, Nicaragua, Honduras, and Guatemala, this population in Panama is largely urban, concentrated in the terminal cities of Panama and Colón, and in the province of Bocas del Toro, giving them high visibility within the nation. Faced with racial discrimination by Americans in the U.S. Canal Zone, and cultural and national prejudice by Panamanians in the rest of the Republic, these canal and banana migrant workers from various Caribbean islands built important cultural and social institutions on the isthmus in order to face these adverse and difficult situations, schools and churches and lodges, etc. And after more than 90 years, that is 1900 to 1990, after more than 90 years in Panama, they no longer refer to themselves as Jamaicans or Barbadians or Martinicans or Trinidadians or Haitians or so on. Rather, they refer to themselves either as West Indians, Antillians, and or Afro-Panamanians. You'll see that there's a disjuncture. Those who still refer to themselves as West Indians or, 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 or Antillians, meaning that they still identify with larger with the English-speaking Caribbean culture, and those who are moving further and further away, uh, trying to identify with a, with a larger Afro-Panamanian group, which includes non-English speakers. And, and this is one of the major conclusions of, of my research. Um, there, are, there, are two, there are two racial ethnic hierarchies in Panama. One in the canal zone, based on the U.S. system, if you're not white, you're black. And another one, which people call a Latin American model, which is uh, uh, also at work in Panama. Um, although blacks are at the bottom of the social pyramid of, in both models, many scholars assert that the Latin American model is less rigid with respect to, I quote unquote, race than the U.S. model. However, in a recent study by Peter Wade, he warns, and I quote, that comparisons between Latin America, that is frequently Brazil, and the United States, while of course valid in principle, can, can by opposing the two in a polar fashion, obscure their common basis. Thus, there is no radical division between the United States and Latin America. Racial meanings have simply been constructed in rather different ways. Nevertheless, it is the polarity of the races in the U.S. controlled canal zone area with its policies of racial separation that led Panamanians to assert, Panamanians, that is none with the Panamanians, led Panamanians to assert that there was no racism or discrimination against blacks in Panama. This, this also is one of the things that West Indians or Antillians have had to live with for most of the 20th century, unable to raise the race question because the idea that there was no racism. And if there was racism, it was on the U.S. canal zone not in the wider republic. These issues, of course, are the issues that came um, um, emerging in that context I talk about of the 1970s. The consensus was that those at the bottom of the social pyramid, including Spanish speakers of colonial descent, suffered from class discrimination, not race discrimination, while blacks from the English and French-speaking Antilles were simply incongruent with the Panamanian culture. It's not that they were suffering from racism, it's that they simply didn't belong. Complicating their racial ethnic status in Panama, Antillians and their descendants, the majority of whom worked on the U.S. Canal Zone area, were recently, uh, until recently, identified by the white mestizo majority as anti-national. That is, West Indians or Antillians were never seen as part of the national culture. Again, issues that West Indians or Antillians raised in the 1970s as to whether or not they were part of the nation or not, and if so, how so. Because of a quote-unquote weak race, race consciousness among Spanish-speaking colonial blacks, the majority of whom were part of an ongoing cultural and racial mestizaje, Antillians and Antillian Panamanians had very few allies in Panama from 1900 to 1970. Nevertheless, the, the colonial blacks, or what we call Negros Coloniales, they also had a difficult time ascending the socio-economic ladder since the Panamanian elite had also privileged the racial model of the United States in some ways. It was not until the 1970s, during the Torrios populist nationalist regime, that, this, that these racial models, particularly the one in Panama, was challenged by Antillian Panamanians and to a lesser extent by a short-lived coalition of Negros Colonialists and Antillian Panamanians. Um, while um, Panamanian economic elites welcomed the fact 
that Antillians are spent part of their earned U.S. dollars, since they work for U.S. firms, uh, in the national economy, the cultural and political elites resented the cultural impact Antillians had on the major cities of Panama and Colón. As I said before, they had great visibility, leading many to support repatriation of these Antillian workers once the canal project was finished in 1914 and to support anti-Caribbean and anti-black legislation in 1928. Um, this all came um, um, to a head under the presidency of Dr. Arnulfo Arias, a Harvard-educated medical doctor, and some people say also fascist, posed the greatest threat to Antillians when he reached the presidency in 1940. Dr. Arias' proposal for repatriating and excluding Antillians and Chinese from political and social life were well received by large numbers of Panamanians from across the social spectrum, uh, many of whom saw the proposal as an integral part of Panamanian nationalism. Now, this situation began to change somewhat in the 1940s after Arnulfo Suarez is overthrown, and when, once he's overthrown, um, uh, after the war is, is ended, uh, there's a, a, a new national um, a constituent assembly that gave citizen rights to Antillian Panamanians. And these citizen rights began to integrate them within the nation as such in terms of educational facilities, etc., etc. Um, at this time, also, um, I want to mention that there are a couple of phenomena that, that began to occur that will affect Antillian life in the, in the isthmus. One was a tremendous um, economic transformation in the society, what was commonly called in Latin America, import substitution industrialization, uprooting a lot of peasants from the rest of Panama who flooded into the cities, going into these <coughs> communities of the Antillians and changing the character of those communities. The other thing that began to occur is that the United States began to change its relationship with Panama in the canal zone and began to expel a lot of those canal zone workers as the U.S. passed industrial and commercial activities to Panama trying to pacify Panamanians not to raise a sovereignty issue. So that affected West Indians in the sense that they lost their jobs and lost their housing because jobs and housing went together in Panama and therefore set the stage for the migration that occurred in the late 50s and early 60s uh, to the United States. Um, once they were here, uh, the other major uh, segment that I look at is how in the 1970s at the conjuncture of, the, of the, the, the military regime, the military regime needed allies, not only to legitimize its rule, but needed allies to help it deal with the U.S. It therefore began to look at this black community, uh, Antillian community in the United States, as a possible advocate for their position. And large numbers of Torrioses, um, entourage, foreign ministers, ambassadors came to a conference at the Poconos in 1974 put together by uh, this black community, giving it an opportunity to raise these issues that I talked about before of ethnicity, race, and class. We'll be right back. For more interviews and related content, you can find us on iTunes, Stitcher, and other podcast distributors. Also, check out our website at www.fredopi.com. Ask questions on Facebook at Frederick Douglass Opie and on Twitter at Dr. Fred D. Opie. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. If you're enjoying the show, check out the episode entitled Plantains and Cilantro, From Africa to Latin America. It's available on the Dinner Table show page. So when you look at the food of a, of a place like um, uh, Peru at Lima, you see a lot of African influences. Again, the introduction of the plantain, the cooking with the plantain, the rice, and even the poultry. There, there are two species of uh, poultry, and one of them is the guinea hen. Again, that comes in from Africa, and you'll see used in different parts of places like Peru. Now back to the show. Why during a period when many southern-born Afro-North Americans migrated to Kansas and northern industrial centers like Chicago and New York, did some choose out-migration to various parts of Latin America? My research objective in this paper is to make two historiographical contributions. First, to address the issues of international labor migration and incorporate labor migration into mainstream labor history. And second, to advance the project of revising labor history that is cognizant 
of lower class perspectives. I argue that Afro North American out migration to Latin America during the period of, 18, of 1880s and 1930s presents an excellent case study in which to study these issues. Examination of, of the reasons why some decided to relocate to Latin America provides interesting insights into Afro North American cultural politics during several important historiographical periods and movements, that is, the rise of industrial capitalism, U.S. economic expansion into Latin America, and the development of Pan-African Pan -African movements in the early 20th century, which involved historic figures such as Zora Hill Nurston, J.A. Rogers, Booker T. Washington, Marcus Garvey, James Weldon Johnson, W.B. Du Bois, and Langston Hughes. Zora Hill Nurston Hurston, uh, spent quite a, uh, quite a uh, period of time doing uh, anthropology research in Haiti, and many of her uh, her works or novels are based on her time in, in Haiti. Uh, J. Rogers is considered one of the foremost Afrocentric writers, and he uh, spent some time on a book dealing with the African roots of many Latin American uh, political figures in Mexico as well as other parts of Latin America and Cuba. Uh, Booker T. Washington, he's significant for this particular paper because he was tracing out migration of African Americans from the southern region, or what we call the Black Belt region, to the, north, to the northern parts of the United States, as I said, uh, Chicago, New York. And he was tracing these movements and provided excellent sources in a, in a, in a collection called the Tuskegee Paper Clippings. And the paper clippings have a whole list of African American periodicals from that period, a period roughly 1880 to 1932. Excellent sources which are incorporated into my research. And Marcus Garvey, Marcus Garvey had uh, several chapters of the UNIA, United Negro Improvement Association, throughout Latin America. And there were six chapters of United of uh, UNIA in Guatemala. James Weldon Johnson was a uh, ambassador, a consulate official in Nicaragua during the very first re revolution in Managua. Many people don't know that, which is a very, very, uh, it's just for me a very phenomenal you know, event in itself being put in that position during a period of Jim Crow and, and you know, adverse races in the United States. And Du Bois, an uh, international figure who was also involved in a lot of working class movements that uh, had uh, contact and influence in Latin America among Latin American activists and scholars. And Langston Hughes, uh, actually, his father moved, and you'll, you'll see some citations uh, from his experience in Mexico, in Toluca. His father was a an immigrant to Toluca, Mexico, and he spent uh, two different summers there. He was uh, fluent in Spanish, also was a correspondent during the Spanish Civil War, and spent a lot of time in Cuba uh, working as a shipmate. So he also has been very influenced by his uh, class relationships, class analysis in Latin America, which he incorporated into his own his work as a poet and novelist. Uh, I just finished doing extensive archival research in, in D.C. at the National Archives. A main part of my research is giving voice to these particular people. And travel accounts, the description is given as negro. So it doesn't tell one's nationality. And it became very problematic identifying these people. I never thought I would come to the day where I was happy about racism. Thanks to racism, <laughs> I could identify who these individuals were. Because on the council records, it would say, it would say uh, for example, John Brown and in parentheses colored because of Jim Crow policy. So it made it very easy for me to identify these people. Ernest Wills of Columbia, Louisiana told the story of how he first came to, to a railroad camp in Paso, Guatemala in 1897. I was going down to the depot in Monroe, Louisiana and met Mr. Randolph. He asked me if I wanted to go to Central America. How much was I getting? I told him I was getting $1.50 per week for driving a tray, which is a strong, low, flat cart for heavy loads for my father. Mr. Randolph told me I could get $3 a day and a dollar off for board. I said, I would go. Randolph said, it wouldn't cost us nothing from Monroe to New, to New Orleans. And fare from New Orleans over, it was $36, which, would, which, we could pay up, which we could pay up in a month's time. And I came along. Seeking to pay back the loan he received from a labor agent for the $36 passage fee and a way to save capital, he moved from one job to another. In his affidavit, Willis clearly defined his strategy for obtaining a greater degree of economic and political autonomy in his new environment. Sell one's productive skills to the highest bidder, pay one's creditors, and do not become dependent on employers for one's basic subsistence needs. Also, I found that at the beginning of my project, I thought I was dealing with predominantly United Fruit workers, Afro-North Afro Americans that came to work for United Fruit. I have since found that 
these people in the time period I'm looking at came to work for the railroad. These were, these were railroad people. Between 1899 and 1900, William T. Penny from Canada wrote that from 70 to 80 Afro-North American workers arrived in Puerto Barrios, Guatemala, on a weekly steamer from New Orleans. Quote, these men cost the contractors about $38 each. This covered their passage and money. The money paid the labor agent in New Orleans together with blanket and mosquito bar furnished each man. Penny states that at times construction projects required, quote, 800 additional men, end of quote. His diary indicates that he preferred Afro North American workers. My initial analysis and theory is similar to uh, familiar with Peter Woods, the black majority dealing with South Carolina, that uh, plantation owners in the South were dependent on or looked at particular groups of Africans because of the sickle cell and their um, resistance to malaria. And I think this is the same situation that's happened in Central America in the lowland area, which is, uh, you know, just full of malaria and infested diseases. That's my initial assumption, and I have to find some documentation to support it. Although it's unclear how many returned to New Orleans, we can es to estimate that himself was responsible for the importation of at least 17,800 consigned Afro-North American laborers to railroad camps throughout Guatemala and other parts of Central America and Mexico. One of Penny's work camps in Guatemala had at times, quote, as many as 100 men at work and in and around the place as as a great many of them had their wives with them in the camp, it really looked like a far-sized village." End of quote. As he did in Honduras, Mexico, and El Salvador, upon the successful, quote, successful close of a job near the Mexican-Guatemala border, Penny abandoned his work crew and returned to his base of operations in Guatemala City. I contend that the actions of contractors like Penny represented an exploitative labor cost cutting strategy of importers of foreign workers. Rather than pay for their upkeep and return passage of their workers after the completion of a job, contractors abandoned them. Penny himself had been responsible for the recruitment and abandonment of groups of some 10 to several hundred Afro-North American workers, workers of other nationalities in various parts, various parts of Central America and Mexico. An example of the unscrupulous practices of labor contractors is his description of the horrific experience of some Chinese migrant workers in Mexico. Quote, there is one small place on the isthmus half an acre in sky, where something over 200 of the unfortunates are buried. It was easy digging there. When the work shut down, the survivors were abandoned to shift, to, to shift for themselves. All the provisions left them was about half a carload of rice. When the rice was consumed, God knows what became of the poor devils, especially those who were so ill they could not travel or, or, to, or, to, or, to, find for the, or to fend for themselves. This I do know, that before I left Mexico, a few of them had reached the city or were begging on the streets. I hope you enjoyed this segment with uh, George Pleasley and I and what we had to share on the Caribbean basin and people of African descent and migration patterns, politics, and culture. You'll find similar information in the uh, Food as a Lens blog. Uh, I've done interviews with George that I referenced, and certainly George is a... Um, a voice that you will see in much of my work uh, and even on my book on um, uh, on New York City politics, uh, Upsetting the Apple Cart, where I have a section on Brooklyn and talk about Afro-Caribbean people in Brooklyn. To check out our podcast archive, suggest show topics and advertise on the show, and to book me as a guest and or speaker, visit our website, www.fredopi.com. That's www.fredopi.com. For information about advertising on the show, please email us at fdopie at gmail.com. That's fdopie at gmail.com. Thanks for listening and be good. <laughs>